Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about state functions and what they are. State functions, as I've got written on the board, are represented through several different uh, easily measurable functions. T over here, oh, oh, on the other side, T over here is temperature, V is volume, okay, P is pressure, and E is energy, all right? All of these particular states, and we call them states because we can easily measure where a reaction is based on each one of the states that are involved here, okay? If you think about it, some books use a, an example of a guy going up a mountain or a guy going up a, a flight of stairs or something like that. So I'm going to use the flight of stairs. If you have a guy going up a flight of stairs, okay, if you think about that, he goes from the first floor to the second floor. What's happened there is that he's changed the internal energy of the system. Okay? By going up the stairs, he's increased the amount of potential energy that's there. So what we've had is a change of state. Okay? Not necessarily the pressure, volume, or temperature have really changed, but what has changed is the amount of potential energy that's been put into the system. So we've had a change of state at that point, and that's why these things are called state functions. The important part about the definition of state functions is that all of these can be controlled in a laboratory environment. So think about it this way. I can take this and I can say one of these is x. So I'll say volume is x. Okay. So I look at volume. What I can do is I can take a chamber that's got a certain amount of gas in there at a certain temperature. Now I'm not doing any reactions, so internal energy is the same. And I can take that chamber and I can change the size of that chamber. I can change the volume. And I can look to see what other impacts it has on other parts of the system. Okay? Does the temperature change? Does the pressure change? Does the energy change? By changing one of the states, I can look to observe what kind of impact it has on the other states. Okay? We have to control all of these states because they're all related to each other, right? I'll give you an example. How many people have ever blown up a balloon? Yes, you can go ahead and raise your hand by a computer. It's okay. All right? The other people need to know that you're talking to your computer. All right? So when you have a blown up balloon, you blow into that balloon. What you're doing is you're increasing the pressure on the inside. So by increasing the pressure on there, I've experienced a change in volume. There's a negligible change in temperature, okay? And you're not doing any reaction at that point. None of the molecules inside are changing, right? So my state function there is a state function change of pressure and how it's affected volume, okay? We can measure all of these things to a certain degree and you learn to apply them to different types of situations, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to break each one of these down into various state functions and then just kind of examine it from there. So my first state function, uh, I teleported on you. My first uh, state function that I'm going to examine is the first law of thermodynamics, okay? And that's for change in U, okay? What is U, you say? Well, no, U's not up here, Dr. Ruane, so I don't know how to... Yes, this is true, okay? But a lot of times, well, the variables are usually consistent, and I close my eyes and I do this kind of thing, kind of frustration, usually consistent. But some people like using other things, okay? Physics, for example, likes changing variables on chemistry. The reason being is that there's a giant war between physicists and chemists that you don't see at night. We fight in underground fight clubs, okay? And we always fight about the same things. It's U, it's E, it's Q, it's W, that type of thing. We always fight, and it's a bloody good time, you know, and then we go out and have pizza afterwards. So, I should never mention that in the video. Don't tell your friends. First rule of physics chemistry fight club is that you don't talk about physics chemistry fight club. But, yes, I just wasted a lot of time of your life talking about that right now. Okay, so back to what we're talking about. The change in U is the change in U final minus U initial. Right? And what U is, it's identified as the internal energy. internal energy of an actual system, okay? So U is the internal energy. What that means, it's a combination of both the potential and kinetic energy. So this is PE and KE. So potential energy, kinetic energy is represented by the um, uh, U value that I've got there. I've also got another symbol, and this symbol is ubiquitous throughout all of chemistry, and that's delta over here. 
Delta, okay, it's not the airplane. Delta means that it's a change. We have a change in the function that's happening here. When we have a change, we're always talking about change from the products versus the change in the reactants. Okay? So if my internal energy gives off a certain amount of energy, and it's perfectly okay to have negative values here because they have meaning if they're positive or if they're negative. All right? So if I look at this, if I have more energy in the final products than I do in the initial products, the overall sign is going to be positive. And what that means is that the internal energy of the system is actually increased. It's absorbed energy somehow. Okay? It may be from its surroundings. If it's isolated from the surroundings, it's got to have some other sort of effect on the state functions in order to make up that particular energy difference. Okay? So that's what these delta signs mean. They mean change. Now, if you're in a higher order math class, you may have seen this already. Have you seen something that means change? I'm sure you have. And if you haven't, I'm going to give you a clue into the future. This is delta. Okay, it's a Greek letter. There's another sign for that. And that's that delta. Does anybody know what that is? Have you seen that before? I hope you have, but if you haven't, it's coming in the future at some valuable time. But what this is, is this is a derivative. This is applied mathematics to chemistry. There's a little difference though. One is calculus and one is algebra. This is the algebraic expression of change. This one down here is the calculus definition of change. Okay? Is there a huge difference? To mathematicians, there is. In chemistry, not a huge difference at this level, but when we get into physical chemistry, there is going to be a difference. It is a measurable difference, and it's an important difference because we can apply calculus to it, and we can start figuring out and predicting how these systems are going to work in thermodynamics. Okay? All right, so that's our first internal energy. And this internal energy expression is actually important because this is the first law of thermodynamics. And the first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Everybody nodding at that? Yes. Not, not at your computer. Yes. Yes, energy cannot be created or destroyed. And why can't energy be created or destroyed? Because according to physics, there's a finite amount of energy in the universe, and that energy will always be here, and it will always exist to a certain degree. Okay? And that energy can be expressed in two ways. It can be expressed in energy, okay, as motion, actually three ways. It can be expressed as light, and it can also be expressed as matter, because Einstein showed that energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. Okay? So the, the first law of thermodynamics is important in chemistry because when we do an experiment, we have to look at the internal energy. We can measure what the energy difference is between both of those states. Okay? So that's what we're looking for as far as energy goes. Okay? But we have to define what these two types of energies are. We have potential and we have kinetic energy. So let's look at those. So I'm going to do some erasing and then we'll look at those a little bit more depth. Okay. So... When I look at internal energy, and I'm looking at reactions, I have to kind of consider, since energy cannot be created or destroyed, there's a relationship between surroundings and the system. Okay? Remember exothermic and endothermic? This is akin to what that is. All right? So if I have any reaction, I know that the change in energy in the system plus the change in energy of the surroundings has to equal zero. Why does it have to equal zero? Because energy cannot be created or destroyed, right? So what this means is that to a certain degree, whatever happens in the surrounding or in the system is going to have an impact on the surroundings so long as it's an open type of system. Okay? What this also means is that my change in energy here from the system is going to be equal to a negative energy value for the surroundings. All right? Does that make sense? If you think about it this way, if I have any sort of system, okay, so here's my system, 
And inside the system, suppose I have a negative 50 kilojoule value. And what this means is because it's a negative sign, remember that, negative sign, it means that energy is being released here. Okay? The negative sign indicates that I have an exothermic reaction. And that means that there's extra energy being released there. And this energy, this exothermic energy, comes from chemical energy being converted into kinetic energy. Okay, and what that means is that once I have this energy here, certain potential energy, the chemical energy, the bond energy, has been broken. And a certain amount of energy has been released when those bonds were broken and then possibly reformed. Usually there's a reformation that occurs. Okay? So this energy is released. And when it's released, that energy leaks into the system. Okay? <clears throat> so what's happening here is that I'm having a change in energy from my system to my surroundings. And the system around it absorbs that energy. Think about it this way, okay? If I have a fire in a room, okay, the room is a certain temperature at the start, but as that fire burns, the room around it is going to get warmer. And this is because the system of the fire is exothermic. It's releasing energy into the surroundings. And by releasing energy into the surroundings, that surroundings are absorbing that energy, okay, and in doing so are accounting for where that energy is going. So that's why I have this particular relationship, and it's an important relationship. Okay? Okay. Now when we're talking about internal energy, remember earlier I had mentioned that internal energy is equal to the sum of potential and kinetic energy in the system. Okay? So now this is also equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy. Okay. In chemistry, what we're going to do is we're going to take those terms and we're going to give them specific variables and specific de definitions as far as what delta U means. Okay? So in this case, delta U is equal to Q plus W. What does that mean? Q is actually a representation of heat. Okay? And W over here is a representation of what we call work. Okay? And if you think about work, if you know anything about physics, work is equal to force times, uh, force times mass, okay? That means that you've got to apply a certain force against a massive object in order to move it. You've got to do some work. So you've got to push a block around. That's what force is equal to, okay? In chemistry, it's a similar function. Our force, or our work in this case, okay, the, the work is being accomplished by a change in volume and a change in pressure. If you think about that balloon, when you're blowing up the balloon, you're changing the volume of the balloon. You're blowing air into it. You have to do some work in order to get that balloon to expand. To make that balloon expand, you're using pressure from your lungs to change the volume of the system. Okay? So as the pressure kind of increases, at a certain point it stops. Okay? So you blow in two atmospheres of pressure, there's going to be a change in volume from when you had 0.5 um, atmospheres of pressure to expand the balloon, okay? So <clears throat> that's what we're looking at here. So work is generally going to be a function of two function of two variables. And that's going to be pressure and volume, okay? Heat is going to be a representation of energy. And how do we measure energy in a chemical reaction? For everybody who said thermometer, pat yourself on the back. You're right. Because the thermometer, when it does in a thermometer is it measures, so here's my thermometer, okay, it measures the energy of whatever you're around, whatever's around there bouncing off of the system, okay? This has a specific kinetic energy, and it's reliant upon the temperature that's in the system. The temperature is a measurement of how fast those molecules are moving. So as the molecules bounce off of this thing, they're transmitting kinetic energy to the inside, mercury or alcohol, whatever's in the bottom of the thermometer. As that heats up, this is going to expand, and my liquid is going to rise up my thermometer. So my thermometer is a measure of the kinetic energy okay, of the system. 
And remember, kinetic energy is a release of energy that comes from thermal systems. So Q over here is a measurement of heat. It's a measurement of the energy inside of a system. And we usually get that using a, a uh, thermometer inside of chemistry. Okay? So those are our, our first two real uh, systems. So I'm going to call this one, and uh, the green's not showing up so well, so I'll just use E here to represent the energy of, of a system. Okay, some writings appeared. I'm making this video, it's, it's going a little bit long, and I know it's riveting information. So I'll make this last a little bit quick. Okay? When I'm talking about Q and W, now I'm looking at the signs involved with Q and W, because signs are everything in thermodynamics. If I have the heat absorbed by the system, okay, or if I have the heat released by the system, which is what, which is what, as far as Q goes, okay, think about that for a second. If heat is absorbed by the system, what's Q going to be? It's going to be a positive value. Good. If it's released by the system, you're right. It's going to be a negative value as well. Now, what about over here with work? If work is done by the system on the surroundings. What's happening? Think about it as that balloon expanding. Work is being done all by the system on the surroundings. So the balloon is expanding. So that means it's pushing against the surroundings. What that means is that my work value in this case is going to be negative. And this is going to be positive. All right? So that means anytime there's a transition of energy from the system to the surroundings, the sign is going to be negative in both of these cases. If there's a transition of energy from the system or the surroundings to the inside, to the system, surroundings to the system, that means I'm going to have a positive value. Okay? Next video on more of this stuff.